Hi, Simon. Good afternoon. So we're going from morning, Simon to Simon. Uh, and the next talk uh, is by uh, Simon Badger from the University of Turin, uh, talking about uh, QCD amplitudes at the precision frontier. Please, Simon. OK, thanks, Victoria. Uh, hello to everyone. Um, Extremely uh, happy to join you today. Thanks very much to the organizers for the invitation. Um, and so I'll be carrying on um, on a similar theme to what Bernhard just told us, uh, looking at QCD corrections um, to uh, perturbative scattering amplitudes that we can use at the LHC. And this is work based on um, increasingly large number of um, collaborators, Christian Bronner Hansen, Hector Chalby, Dima Cecerian, Thomas Gehrman, by Hatanto Johannes Hen, uh, Matteo Macoli, Robin Mazuka, Ryan Moody, Tiziano Peraro, Jakob Chris, and Simone Zoya. And uh, very helpful, very grateful for all of their input to this work. Okay, so just to set the scene, um, at, uh, as we've seen from Bernard's talk, Hadron Collider is a kind of a, a messy environment. And we're looking to learn something about the very smallest scale scattering process, the hard scattering process, uh, where we can reach between one and even up to just about three TB for the hardest uh, scale. Um, but we need to find a way to mat between the experimental signatures, which are gonna be seen after these uh, hard um, scattering processes decay and evolve down to low energies where we actually see particles in the detector. So we've got a huge range of orders of magnitude to cover uh, and we need to do the best job we can to try and match this to the precise theory we have. So we're working within the regime of factorization and that means we have to first integrate um, over the uh, uh, momentum fractions, x1, x2, apart from distribution functions, and then uh, multiply that by the um, partonic cross-section. And it's that partonic cross-section which you then have to integrate over a further phase space, quite a complicated um, large uh, dimensional phase space, and the square of the, the scattering amplitudes. So as we look to apply scattering amplitudes to this procedure, it puts those, those amplitudes under quite a lot of strain because we need to cover uh, a large phase space. And that means we need to evaluate these things very, very uh, large number of times. And like I said, we're trying to figure out a way to do precision measurements of these, of, uh, these kind of uh, uh, observables and try to get around all of the sort of soft physics background that, uh, that will, uh, will accompany any event that we see at the LHC. Okay, so this slide is right, quite familiar to uh, what Ben had just showed us. Uh, and of course, there is uh, a lot of different ways we can see the precision frontier. Uh, we focus on QCD corrections because those are the dominant ones. And given the large range of uh, LHC data, pushing towards the percent level, one to ten percent precision, is really covering a wide, rather wide variety of different signatures and different. Uh, final state particles. Barnhard uh, focused at the, uh, the N3 alone level where the current state of the art is to have uh, total cross sections or differential cross sections in some cases for two to one processes. Uh, so a huge number of, uh, huge amount of progress there. He also showed us the nice summary of um, um, the progress for two to two differential cross sections. There are some work that's uh, coming about for uh, three loop corrections at for two to two scattering. At the current level, we're not able to do differential cross sections for those things, but we have seen a new set of three loop four particle amplitudes, and there's been a couple of papers from Fabrizio Caola, uh, Andreas von Manteuffel, and Lorenzo Tancredi this year, uh, pushing that, that frontier. Um, for the purposes of this talk, we'll be looking at the frontier of looking at high multiplicity scattering, high multiplicity being two to three scattering at next to next leading order, and look at the developments in that curve post 2018. So the um, 
the processes that we've seen calculated have actually just come out over the last 18 months or so for looking at processes like three photon production uh, and diphoton plus jet and rather recently the first corrections to three jet production uh, at the LHC, which is really a, uh, a remarkable result. So it's those things that I'd like to tell you, the ingredients that go in, uh, the kind of things that uh, cause us difficulty and how we overcome them. So as I said, this is where we've been sat at the moment. To make these kind of contributions, we have to combine both real and virtual contributions. Uh, and that means scaffolding amplitudes for two to three at the level of the two loop amplitudes. Uh, four point amplitudes for real virtual and uh, seven point amplitudes for the double real radiation. Okay, um, all, all of this comes with the caveat that, yeah, if we're really trying to push towards percent level predictions, uh, then eventually we're going to have to worry about a lot of other things as well. Um, worry about potential electroweak corrections as well, uh, mass effects everything that, uh, well, most of the stuff that's uh, working in this, in this kind of field at the moment is restricted to massless particles. Um, and also worry about how these hard scattering perturbative um, amplitudes and cross sections connect with the, the soft physics of resummation, parton showers and so on. Okay. So the frontier that we'll, we'll look at is two to three scattering. Um, it's something which is extremely interesting from the phenomenological point of view. Uh, I think especially because we can see, we can create for the first time uh, a bunch of ratio uh, quantities, things where we can look at the ratio of two to three over two, two scattering, where a lot of the universal soft physics, which confused that picture I showed you on the first side with all the parton showers, potential underlying event, uh, can uh, be cancelled out. So a lot of systematic errors cancel both in theory and the experimental side, leading to a set of high precision observables. And the kind of things that we'd like to look at uh, is the strong coupling, obviously. Uh, if we could look at things like um, diphoton plus jet, we can consider the backgrounds of the Higgs PT because of the interference with the Higgs to gamma gamma to K channel. Uh, processes with even more scales, potentially with a massive uh, particle in the external state Higgs or vector boson, we can start obviously studying um, different aspects of the Higgs PT spectrum and uh, the Higgs coupling through vector boson fusion, um, ratios of W plus, W minus, and so on. So there's quite a lot of um, different uh, procedures, different things that we could study if we were able to calculate these processes. This list has been around for quite a long time. Um, so we know what we could do with it. The problem has been that we're unable to calculate the matrix elements that go into these predictions. So the, I said that the two loop amplitudes were the bottleneck, and that's true. We, um, the, 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 a subtraction procedure has in principle been known for a while now. Uh, the, these amplitudes were the only missing ingredient, although combining them at this high multiplicity is certainly a non-trivial task. Uh, I won't um, tell you any more details about that, but we'll have another talk on Friday from Chiara Signorelli Signorelli, who will tell us the latest updates on, on how we can deal with these extra uh, contributions. All right. So uh, what, what is that actually causing the, the problems here? Right. We have lots of advanced techniques for catching scattering amplitudes. Certainly if we look at talks throughout this conference, many people will be dealing with more than five legs and with more than two loops. So what's, what's the, the problem that we have uh, when applying these things to QCD amplitudes? Uh, well, okay, there's a lot of things to put together. Um, we have to uh, handle many, many different channels because of the um, partonic contributions, both in the PDFs and the final states. We have to sum over all the color, all the listy configurations, and that means that we need a really quite high level of automation. Um, in, any kind of standard approach, we will hit the, the classic problem of large intermediate expressions, and we'll need to come up with new methods which can overcome the algebraic complexity uh, of these processes. So as we go up from the known two to two processes to two to three, obviously we have more scales, and that really uh, challenges uh, much of the standard technology. And the other thing that we have to understand is 
how to uh, understand the function space, but understand the function space from the point of view of where we're going to apply this. Uh, and that means that we need to worry about efficient and stable numerical evaluation of the final results, and therefore need to overcome the analytic complexity of the, uh, the expression, right? And uh, yeah, I, uh, I chose uh, some images here of um, bottles from uh, different places where I felt uh, there were significant contributions to these kind of problems. They've obviously been around a while and we've had lots of uh, interesting suggestions, um, but uh, I'll let you have a look and see if you can guess what I mean. I think I probably did uh, a uh, maximally bad job of this by thinking a little bit about it, but not enough to really cover the space, but at least there's a few things you can think about. Ask me later if you're interested. Okay, so uh, we have actually had a lot of uh, um, progress in this area just in the last uh, 12 months or so. So it's really nice to be able to summarize it for you here today. Um, so from around 2013, where we saw some of the first results for you know, genuine QCD uh, scattering amplitudes at two loops. Um, at the start, we were worried most about the integrands for these functions. And then as we started to learn more about the function space, uh, we were able to extract more information uh, for, about uh, the um, uh, five gluon or plus amplitude, which is this result here. Um, at the same time, we were thinking about how to address this problem of algebraic complexity. And there were two important papers I felt that sat, sat in here uh, concerning the use of finite field arithmetic. So this is modular arithmetic, arithmetic modular prime number, both for use in the classic integration by parts identities, but also in more generally by Tiziano Pereira in the context of full scattering amplitudes. So that led to a burst of progress on uh, applying these kind of takes, techniques to QC amplitude calculations um, and getting the first analytic uh, expressions for these two to three scattering amplitudes. Uh, and after that, we've seen then very recently the first differential uh, prediction, cross section prediction, combining both uh, the two loop uh, double virtual and the real radiation real virtual. Uh, to get the first uh, real physical predictions for these processes. And in terms of understanding the function space, so the uh, uh, analytic complexity that I referred to, there was a key uh, paper that appeared last year from Dimitri Cherian and Vasily Sotnikov, uh, where they provided a, um, a full, fully stable and uh, um, reliable uh, C++ imitation for the kind of special functions that appear in these amplitudes in C++. And that was a culmination of a lot of work um, from let's say even uh, 20, 2015 um, to get to that stage. So it takes a long time to really understand the details of these special functions in such that they can really be useful in the um, phenomenological uh, environment. So yeah, lots of progress, but a really rapid uh, set of papers, which I'd like to summarize for you today. Okay. So, okay, for the next few slides, let's look at some of the new results that have actually come out. Uh, I've said a few uh, words on this before, but we've had uh, some new results for massless fire particle scattering. And this is, again, thanks to a lot of work that was done from the uh, point of view of the special functions and the identification of a sensible basis of pentagon functions. Uh, and that's led to a whole bunch of new uh, numerical codes, fast numerical codes, um, which can evaluate uh, these processes in the physical region where they're required. So that's a new, a new element of these things uh, that they're now available in the physical scattering region where they were not before. Um, for mass list um, jet production, so PPT3 jets, that's five partons, so all configurations, five gluons, um, two quarks, three gluons, and four quarks in a gluon, all available at uh, leading color. Uh, and all in, implemented in a publicly available code. We've had two different calculations for the production of three photons, both of the holistic amplitudes, um, and a, more recently, a number of results for diphoton plus jet production uh, by two different groups. 
Firstly, in this leading color approximation where we only contain planar graphs, but much more recently, um, a couple of results come out for non-planar corrections. That's the first application for an amplitude beyond the planar limit, where we really contain all the full color information, complete information for the uh, amplitude. And we'll go through a few details of our calculation um, for the gluon fusion contribution to dark photon plus jet a little bit later on. Um, looking at a different class of processes, these are five particle scattering probes with an off-shell leg. Again, lots of, lots of progress, lots of uh, interest in understanding the integrals, which was really the first stage of these kind of processes. We had some nice results uh, last year from uh, Abru, Ita, Moriello, Page, Chernow, and Zeng, where they uh, applied this method of a numerical evaluation of the differential equation using generalized series expansions. So this is a different way to treat the special functions, slightly different to the way the pentagon functions work, but a uh, very general way to handle these um, complex cases where we have this additional off shell scale. Uh, and there are additionally, there are some um, analytic expressions in terms of generalized poly logarithms attained uh, by the group in uh, Greece. So um, again, the two papers that we've had this year concerned the amplitudes for these processes. We've restricted ourselves to the planar limit again for these uh, offshore processes. So massless um, partons plus one heavy uh, W or Higgs boson, uh, and those were the, the first the calculations, and I'll again go through some details later. Um, non planar, still work in progress, but there was just a paper uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, on one of the important uh, non planar contributions. So, rapid progress in this, these kind of, uh, this direction as well. Um, the last sort of, uh, sort of different direction we can go in with these kind of techniques is to worry about uh, scattering amplitudes with massive propagators. Uh, so things that we run for top quark production, um, very well studied process, and we're still not quite at the, the, uh, the same level we, we are with those other massless uh, scattering problems in that we're not quite yet able to deal with two to three scattering. Um, but it's certainly interesting to look at the analytic form for these amplitudes. Numerical solutions have been available for a, a rather long time. Um, but still, actually, due to the um, appearance of elliptic, uh, elliptic kernels, um, you know, uh, compact enough and stable enough um, analytic form for the um, four point PP to TT bar amplitudes at two loops are uh, still not yet known. But there's been a couple of paces, papers uh, on, on that kind of thing. And I'll tell you a little bit about our own work on that a bit later on. OK. So that's your summary of the, the state of the art. Uh, I'll now switch to telling you a few of the, the details of actually how we put these things together, at least from our side. Um, we have uh, our loop level scattering amplitude in dimensional regularization, um, where we have a set of rational coefficients to determine and a set of uh, basis integrals or special functions. And we also have the fact that all of these amplitudes contain a whole bunch of um, poles that have to be cancelled in the final uh, result in order to get a finite um, remainder that can go into the, uh, the amplitude calculation. So we have all these ingredients that we'd like to put together. And we'd like to go through an analytic um, calculation for these things so that we have something that's really fast and stable and well understood um, for uh, flexible phenomenological applications. Okay. There's kind of three ingredients that would go into this thing. The first thing being uh, the integrands. Um, we have a well-established technique for dealing with integrands, it's Feynman diagrams. It's not very elegant, but, um, or at least maybe it is very elegant, but it's sometimes not very practical. Um, and we have lots of other things that we can use in our arsenal to try and simplify this, this, uh, this part of the, the problem. Uh, we're gonna try and expose on-shell simplicity as soon as we can. Spinalisti method is a great way to do that. We can also start using unitarity cuts or the um, modern in incarnations, generalized cuts, numerical unitarity. We had a nice talk yesterday about the prescriptive unitarity methods, which we can use to more directly uh, extract 
um, the information that we need for the amplitudes uh, and yeah, other um, tools in our arsenal, physical projectors, and uh, maybe some off-shell recursion techniques, all of which enable us to generate uh, an efficient set of input. Um, but we still have to reduce that integrand onto a basis of special functions. And the techniques for doing that are um, integration by parts of entities. So these things have been around obviously for many, many years, uh, 40 years actually since to check in and chuck, chuck, catch off. Um, described how to, to use those things efficiently to do uh, the beta function in QCD. Um, it was in 2000 when Stefano Laporta taught us that we can have an algorithmic solution to the integration by parts identities, but they involve solving a large linear algebra problem. And the development that I alluded to earlier is that we're gonna try and use this finite field arithmetic to numerically solve this large linear system and avoid the, the need to um, reconstruct the analytic solutions to the integration by parts identities. And that's a technique that's been explored by several groups, in addition to just generating the IVPs in the way that Stefan Porter uh, had in mind. A lot of work is going into how we can use computational algebraic geometry to write simpler systems of, uh, of equations um, and uh, avoid bottlenecks that will appear in this in this part of the problem. And it's really this part of the problem that causes us the most uh, trouble at the moment, actually. Okay, so if we have a way to reduce to a basis of special functions, the method that we have to identify some um, functions base is by solving differential equations. Um, again, established technology, uh, Kosakov back in 1991 and works with Bowen Dixon Kosowa, Ettore Remidi, and Thomas German, and more likely uh, Johannes Henn, who taught us how to apply these differential equations in canonical form. And that's been a really important ingredient into the way that we can expand these complicated uh, amplitudes out into a sensible basis of functions. All right. Okay. So, as I said, the challenge also here is, is uh, automation uh, and a way to uh, put all these things together in one place such that we can efficiently extract the ingredients that we need. Um, our framework actually at the moment is, is uh, has fine diagrams at the bottom of it. Um, that's a, a part that can be uh, replaced or optimized at a later stage, but with a little bit of help with form and Mathematica, and more importantly, uh, uh, expressing the, um, the variables for our amplitudes, the rational uh, coefficients in terms of a minimal set of variables supplied by momentum twisters, we can get a set of color ordered holistic amplitudes which are ready for uh, reduction with the integration by parts. The next few stages of this problem are all implemented in, within Tiziano Perot's finite flow code, which is a framework for doing the modular arithmetic um, for a different set of algorithms that allows us to combine the input from the, the diagrams straight into the integration by parts identities, and then uh, do additional manipulations to remove the infrared new V um, subtraction, expand into a basis of special functions, and finally subtract analytically just the finite remainder. And the coefficients, the rational coefficients in this finite remainder no longer depend on epsilon. We've done the epsilon expansion. So we're in four dimensions, and that's kind of important to make sure that we see cancellations, cancellations, exact cancellations, without needing to reconstruct larger intermediate steps such as these coefficients in C and D here. And the final expression is in some sum sort of independent set of monomials in special functions. So we have to understand a little bit about what these kind of special functions would be. Okay. All right, very good. So let's see how it works in practice. So at least set some of the results. So the process that we, we focused on for the five particle massless case was uh, the production of two photons uh, and three gluons. So gluon, gluon to diphoton plus an extra jet. Um, actually, this contribution is loop induced. So it means technically, if we're doing the expansion alpha s, this would contribute at n3 alone because there's no interference with the tree. 
But because of the large gluon flux that we have at the LHC, this is an important contribution to add to the, the, um, the quark channel. Um, it has the, the feature that we cannot take a leading color limit, which um, gets rid of the complicated non-planar diagrams. So we do a full uh, color decomposition of our amplitude just in terms of some charge factors for the U and D uh, quarks. Um, the color decomposition is trivial, it's just one structure constant, FABC. Uh, and then we expand in alpha s for the amplitude. Those amplitudes further decompose into a polynomial in NC and NF, the number of light fermion loops. And we have, as I said, this, uh, these three new amplitudes for leading color NC, one over NC, uh, A2, and the fermion loops, each which contain large number of permutations of these four basic uh, integral topologies. And the integration by parts identities for these were generated with the help of light red and then processed with the finite flow code. Uh, and in addition, we made use of syzygy relations uh, computed using the algorithm of Rob Schrodinger uh, just for the, the planar sectors to speed up our, um, our evaluations. Okay. So, um, yeah, interestingly enough, actually, it's, uh, it's slightly um, uh, non or counterintuitive that the leading color limit for this amplitude actually contains the planar parts, whereas the subleading color, the one over NC, is actually planar, which is something that we didn't realize until later because we didn't look for it. But yeah, we have an argument of the paper where you can see actually this is perfectly easy to understand just from the color. Um, but uh, yeah, the, it's the subleading color, which is planar, completely uh, opposite to what you see with other five point massless scattering problems. Okay. So as I said, large number of permutations to, to handle makes pretty heavy work for the integration by parts and entities. So having chained all of those steps together, we can start looking at the polynomial degrees in the momentum twister parameterization that we chose. So there's five variables for this problem. We set one of them to one, it's just an overall scale. So we have four variables uh, left to fit and we look at the degrees in those variables for both the numerator and the denominator. And we see some fairly large uh, polynomials when we look at all of the range of different helicities that we need to consider. These are all MHV type configurations, um, which are the worst things that we get for these two, three massless scattering. Okay. So um, at this level, given the amount of time that it takes to evaluate the IVPs, we're kind of struggling to, to uh, to reconstruct the analytic results. So we can numerically evaluate it modular prime field, but we can't do much more than that. So we have to look for uh, better ways to look at the final answer. Uh, and the first thing that one can think of is linear relations between the coefficients in the uh, basis of pentagon function monomials. Um, if we include in this information that was known from the planar five parton scattering, five gluon scattering, uh, we actually drop the degrees a considerable amount. There's a lot of overlap between this amplitude and other amplitudes. Now, we don't know exactly the form of that, that relations, but we can just put everything into a linear system, solve for a handful of uh, phase space points, uh, and extract only the independent um, coefficients that we need. Uh, a second stage of processing involves doing a univariate slice. So just setting all of the variables to numbers except one. And on that univariate slice, which is obviously much easier to compute, we can match with an ansatz of functions, which is largely determined by the alphabet of the differential equations, but with some other um, ingredients thrown in from the spinner listy um, kind of spinner products that you can get in variance and so on. Um, and uh, that in, indeed drops the degree down to something sensible. It's still a little bit high um, in some cases, so we were able to do a little bit better. And it was doing a univariate um, partial fractioning that really get, gets us down to a sensible type of function. Um, it's important that it's univariate uh, because this is something that we can do without having to reconstruct the function first. 
So a multivariate um, apart would potentially lead to a more compact representation, but this is something that we can do without analytic knowledge of the full function. Uh, and that enables to break us down to some really sensible uh, kind of numbers to evaluate this, this full chain um, and get us down to something that we can actually reconstruct the analytic um, result. So I think it's nice within this, um, this finite flow approach, we can join all these modular arithmetic algorithms together. At no point do we ha have to reconstruct the large intermediate state and we um, find all of the cancellations that would happen for the final remainder and break down into this uh, partial fraction result. Okay, so once we've done that, we have to put everything together into something that we can evaluate for the color and holistic summed hard functions. This is something that we've done and we put into a C++ code that we put into NJET. And just to sh show that, you know, this is something which is doing what, what we, we wanted, namely a sta fast and uh, stable um, evaluation over a set of physical phase space points. It's 100,000 points that we use for testing. Um, and, you know, an average evaluation time around 26 seconds per point so okay i say fast it's obviously a lot slower than other amplitudes that have existed uh, that we've worked in the past but something that's manageable for um phenomenological applications and something as well that we have a precision fixing um framework set up to make sure that we can um provide an adequate number of digits over that full phase space um as i said the technology here for massless five particles also been applied to this um, three jet um, calculation and we've checked that uh, we agree with the recent results uh, in this paper and we'll include include those results um, within our own code uh, in due course okay so I don't know how I'm doing on time I've probably got five minutes or so left I hope to uh, tell you a little bit about um, processes with an off-shell uh, particle as well um, so this was a calculation we did back in January with by Hotanto and Simone Zoya to look at uh, WBB bar production uh, in the limit of massless bottom quarks and uh, planar or leading color approximation. We also took the approximation for an on-shell W. So it's really like the simplest scenario we could think of to test the uh, off-shell um, off kinematics, five point with one off-shell leg. Okay. Um, the problem here was trying to think of a sensible special function basis where we could identify a, a hard function, so an analytic representation for the finite remainder, something where we can remove analytically the poles of the function. And that turns out to be something quite important because it reduces the complexity of the um, object that we have to extract. So this is the finite remainder sort of likes to live in four dimensions and depends on uh, in principle, fewer uh, special function uh, monomials than the most general thing that would appear in the differential equations. So thanks to the work uh, last year from Abreu et al, and also okay, this work from uh, Moriello on the generalized series expansions, um, we knew all of the integrals that went into this thing in a canonical differential equation. Um, but it's still difficult from there to identify a basis for the finite remainder. Uh, but we have some other information. If we've got the canonical form, it's rather easy to expand these integrates into so-called Chen iterated integrals, uh, where we understand how to uh, apply shuffle relations to get an independent function basis. We also have some, what are quite lengthy, um, but um, just in terms of generalized polylogarithms or multiple polylogarithms expressions for the analytic answers, which is extremely important in order to understand the boundary terms for these integrals. So our plan for the function basis was to use the master integral components as a, uh, as a function basis, right? But determine the relations between the uh, master integral components, right? Based on um, how they would, uh, taking into account the shuffle relations between the expanded integrals and use um, high precision evaluation of around a thousand digits for the boundary terms to determine relations to the master integral components. So this gives us then what we can derive from that is a new differential equation. So rather than for the master integrals, 
for the independent components in the expansion of those master integrals in epsilon. And this allows us to find analytically the cancellation of the infrared and ultraviolet poles. Simon, you yeah. have five minutes and a few more minutes for questions. Sounds good, thanks. Okay. So with that in mind, actually, we were able to, to say, extract analytically the finite remainders. And it was the identif identification of a suitable basis of uh, special functions that allowed us to do that with exactly the same technology I said uh, from you uh, before. Um, and we can evaluate this in the same way that uh, the master integrals were shown uh, before. Here, making use of Martin uh, Hiddings diffex package just here, for example, we have a slice across the, um, the, the phase space, a random slice. We see some features here, which are just related to the tree level propagators. Uh, and okay, the idea here was again to show that we have a relatively uh, stable evaluation across the phase space and a reasonable evaluation time. This evaluation of 260 seconds per point is really, really an upper bound. And we can discuss if you like exactly what that would be in a phenomenological situation. Okay, since I have only a couple of minutes left, I'll sketch through the calculation for Higgs to BB bar. Uh, the new ingredients here, again, it's an off-shell leg five-point part, five-particle process where we've extracted the analytic finite remainders. Um, all the different channels that we had to, to go through here, and we've included holistic amplitudes, which we didn't in WBB bar. So that's a new, new part of the thing. Again, the partial fractioning uh, was really important to get this down to a manageable problem. Um, yeah, just a few comments on the, the finite remainder basis functions. So this is actually the same, it's the same basis for WBB bar, but I'll comment on it here. Um, we find actually that in the basis of master integral components, the F, um, versus the basis of special functions which span the final remainder after the subtraction of the poles, a lot of information drop out. So seven letters actually drop out in the finite remainders. Um, and we see only 23 of the possible weight four uh, functions actually appear in the final answers. Obviously that um, simplifies the, the evaluation of the final remainders a lot. Um, okay. and. This takes into account both the subtraction of the poles, but also in the case of Higgs BB bar, because we took the massless limit, we have to renormalize the Yukawa coupling as well. Okay, but similar um, sets for nice smooth behavior as we look at all these slices across the, um, the, the phase space for the various different channels in, in, this, in this process. All right, so maybe if I take two minutes, to mention the last thing that I, I promised you, which was to look at a simple process, but with massive internal propagators. Here again, uh, the challenge is to deal with um, uh, both the complexity from the uh, massive particles, but also the elliptic um, uh, sectors that turn up. And the reason we were interested in doing this, well, there's two things. So the first Thing I'll say, okay, we'll skip this basically, but um, we were able to uh, um, extract a list of amplitudes for this using uh, a projection basis, which was uh, useful in order to use the uh, momentum twist technology and fit it into the, the tool chain that I showed you before. Um, but the other thing that was interesting is because recently there were some results for the top quark, heavy quark loop um, that would contribute to this process. Um, which was written into iterated intercourse over three elliptic curves. So it's quite a complicated function, certainly something that I wanted to understand more about. And I don't think that I fully uh, finished my um, understanding of it, but uh, we wanted to see how amplitudes looked rather than just the integrals. And um, we, were, we were able to do that. So we had this direct reconstruction of the finite remainders. And we saw a, a sort of reduction in the number of iterated integrals or monomials of iterated integrals that appear in the final result. Um, but there was still information um, that was missing that we would not have missed if we'd have followed the procedure um, for the massless functions. So there are, do seem to be um, relations beyond the, the shuffle relations, which we needed to find in order to uh, analytically cancel the poles. So we found a few uh, sort of basically integration by parts identities um, that would uh, remove that um, uh, complexity in terms of the poles. 
Um, but I think in terms of really understanding in general how to analytically write down the function spaces for the final remainders, uh, was still a little bit of work to do. And I was kind of interested in the talk yesterday by Clem and I have talks later from Vinesel and Dora on this kind of subject. So I think there's lots to learn in the future. Okay, so that brings me to my outlook. I'm on, on time. I gave you a, a quick review of all the kind of multi-scale two-loop amplitudes in QCD uh, that we've able, been able to calculate at the moment. So new techniques are really reaching maturity so that we're finally able to attack this wish list of um, processes that have been around for a long time. Um, the modular arithmetic has been, for me, uh, something that's played a key ro role in reducing complexity and uh, avoiding um, intermediate, large intermediate expressions. Uh, and we're starting to get, as I said, lots of fast and reliable um, analytic you know, codes for um, use in phenomenal applications. And I think, you know, just since uh, the, the Zoof Working Group reports, so the Zoof Working Group is uh, a mix of experimentalists and, and uh, theorists that get together to discuss the kind of things that we might want to do uh, for future experimental analysis. And just since uh, March 2000, uh, 2020, sorry, um, we've seen a whole load of new processes ticked off from that. Uh, so fully differential, three jets, uh, the diphoton and the triphoton also now um, uh, available and the first amplitudes appearing for these off-shell processes as well. And I'm sure we'll see a lot of these uh, things ticked off in the next, next few years. So lots of interesting uh, physics to do from this point. Anyway, that's where I'll leave you today. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you for this very nice and comprehensive review. So now let's get to the questions. David, please. So first of all, it's very heartening to see PSLQ and the Chinese remainder theorem turn to such good account in practical physics, having tried to develop those methods 20 years ago. My question concerns glue glue goes to uh, photon plus two jets, where I think I heard you said there are uh, one upon NC corrections that come from planar diagrams. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Can, can you quantify them? I mean, obviously, it depends upon where you are in phase space, but how important are they given that you... you oh, that's a, that is a good question. So, um, yeah, so it turns out um, the, the, the subleading colour are significantly reduced so it's just because it's, it's one over NC, but there's also some kinematic expression there as well. So you get roughly between sort of one and 10%, depending on where you are in the phase space of the contribution from the one over NC. Um, in the paper, actually, we gave a ratio, but I stupidly don't have it available. If you give me two minutes, I can look up the, the ratio. So. That sorry. Okay, so the NC one over NC to NF is roughly two thousand to one to ten. So the one over NC is significantly um, suppressed, but it just complained it contains planar diagrams. So it's um, it's the I think the, the permutations that are causing the cancellations there. Okay, uh, Matt, please. Hi. So you sort of gave a you know this old wish list of different processes people have been interested in, and the wish list on your slide sort of ended with a proton proton goes to vector vector plus jet. Mm -hmm. I'm curious whether you anticipate any um, need or interest in uh, in something like proton proton goes to three massive particles. Um, uh, where, yeah, where so you something like uh, TTH, TTZ would be really nice as well. Um, I, I think uh, the reason why they're not on that list is because they're so far ahead of what we can think of at the moment um, with, say, the extra complexity of both the internal mass scale and an extra uh, external scale. Um, it's uh, one of the things that 
you know, we can't quite handle at the moment, but that would be certainly really useful physics you or, could do with it. Or three vector bosons. Exactly, yeah. 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 Ben, please. Hi, Simon. Hi, Ben. Um, so I have two questions, but let me know if I'm pushing for time. Um, the first is in your univariate partial fractions, mm -hmm. um, how algorithmic is the choice of the variable with which you're partial fractioning with respect to? Uh, it's not uh, It's not algorithmic, but there's very few choices that we have. Right, so we're down to four variables that we can, mm -hmm. that we can use in that univariate uh, partial fraction when we get there. Okay, so you, you just tried all right, of them? So the, and then... the, the overall energy scale is gone. So there's four left and then, okay, you've got, you've got a few to, to choose. And it does, it does depend uh, a lot on those, right? Not all of them uh, give us nice results. But we find that okay. in this momentum twister parameterization, there's some neat separation between the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic type variables. And that means there's a neat partial fraction for them. And it, mm -hmm. as I say, there's, if you do the multivariate partial fraction, you can get a better representation, but you can't, it's easier, it's not possible to get the, the ansatz for that partial fraction without knowing more about the function. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks. Um, the second thing I wanted to ask was that you um, uh, said that you were using syzygies in your ABPs. Yeah. Um, do you have uh, any comment on the efficiency improvements that you get when you use these things? They were really good for the planar sector. They were really good for plane failure, a factor of 10 or something, maybe on the speed. But I think what we, what I appreciated more from that was the, the reduction in memory cost. So I think I generally run out of memory. There was actually a question in the chat about how parallelizable this is. And the answer is it's, it's trivially parallelizable, the number of evaluations that you need to do if you find enough machines. But the problem is the memory usage is quite high. So unless you have many, many machines with a lot of memory, uh, it's tough to run these kind of uh, procedures, but the SysG is actually reduced because the size of the system goes down, the memory consumption dropped a lot as well as the time to evaluate the system. But yeah, roughly 10, a factor of 10 on time, I guess. Thanks. Yeah. Lance, please. Hey, thanks, Simon, for a nice talk. I'm trying to understand the, the scaling uh, with the number of kinematic variables in the mm -hmm. computation time. Like yeah. how, how many points do you need to throw over a finite finite fields uh, before you can reconstruct the whole function? I guess in the all massless case, there's four dependence on four variables. And mm -hmm. how would it change if you add a if you add a fifth variable for a W mass or something? Yeah. I mean it scale, it scales quite uh, quite badly. <laughs> Uh, especially using the moment, momentum twist and parameterization that we use, uh, which I don't think is necessarily the best, but it's something that's uh, convenient. Um, what we found was that the partial fractioning, after partial fractioning, uh, the degrees were roughly the same for the off shell as they were for the, uh, the massless five parton. But it's not exactly a fair comparison because the partial fractioning also involves some extra work for the finite field algorithm. So while the, the so I showed in those plots, the, the number of points that we needed, for example, in Higgs BB bar here. Uh, so that's where that yeah. table. And this okay. number of points here is the sampling after partial fractioning. So it's actually in four variables, it's a bit lower. But these are the, so you know, a thousand or, or you know, 20,000. That's with average. one off shell guy. Yeah. You need, uh, Few thousand, and if it, if it were massless, what would those if numbers? It was massless, be? those those uh, the number of points would would uh, say drop a little bit, but after partial fractioning, it's actually comparable. So a few okay. thousand. Okay. Yeah. But Thanks. It's, uh, it is a good question, but uh, difficult to give a very concrete answer. Thanks. So, are there any more questions for Simon? If not, uh, let's thank Simon again for this uh, very nice comprehensive review. And uh, we reconvene again at uh, 